ray mine blasting to loosen copper ore from the hard rock has triggered a rockfall too close to one of the mine's mechanized shovels. And the impact has taken it out of action. The 250,000 ton target is starting to look impossible. We're pulling up to the machine here. The guys are already on it. The, the crews are here. We'll pull up here and see what we have for damage. There's only one machine Bill can turn to. The Latourno 2350 loader is the only machine that can match the shovel's power. Putting pedal to the metal, Eric pushes the loader's 3300 horsepower engine to the limit. With 30 times the power of a normal car under the hood, Eric eats up the distance. But the rocky mine floor is tough on any vehicle. Holy shit, I think I have a hole in my chain. Yeah, it's a 96 loader. I got a problem with my right front chain. The loader's $90,000 wheels are covered with 30 meters of steel chain to provide grip in extreme driving conditions. And the hard ground has torn a hole in the steel web. Ace mechanics Nate and Steve are straight on the case. But Eric knows that work at the rock face is at a standstill while they wait for the loader. I need those chains tightened ASAP. I got some muck to move. Yeah, okay, man, why don't you come down here and give us a hand? Yeah, here's the tools. Why don't you get down here and buy them, man? Ah, f you guys. Get out of here. With jobs on the line, the pressure to get the loader back into action is intense, and the strain is starting to show. The problems at the Ray mine have caused severe delays. In the mine control center, Brandon has his eye on the clock. Every time my truck's parked, they're getting, you're losing money. The only way the mine will survive is by meeting targets. However tough today's conditions are, they can't make exceptions. Keeping the production going keeps the town alive. If it wasn't for the mine, this place would be pretty much a ghost town. At mid-morning, the temperatures are touching some of the highest known to mankind, 50 degrees Celsius. Losing money, so that's why we have to get it back up and going as soon as possible. When Eric and his loader arrive, the ore face is silent. The damaged shovel is still down. Very important that we get this muck moved. It's a race against the clock. The 2350 has to match the downed shovel's work rate. The loader's 30 cubic meter bucket chomps through the rubble. Right down the middle, that's the way we like it. With truck after truck heading to the crusher, the loader is earning every cent of its $5 million price tag. The loader will keep working in the area as long as it takes. Make sure we uh, have the uh, material balanced out in this bucket, or else it could be disaster. The Liebherr 282 haul trucks at the Ray Mine are some of the biggest in the world. Even for veteran driver Lonnie McNavage, just keeping the machine on the mine's steep roads isn't easy. More or less like uh, driving a small house. <laughs> Down in the pit of the mine, Eric and the loader are going great guns. Even with one shovel out of action, they're eating into the daily target. Truck after truck is loaded up and thousands of tons of rock make their way back to the crusher. But just when things look like they're going to plan, a summer storm blows in out of nowhere. Day turns to night as clouds blot out the sun. In only minutes, the mine is turned from a dust bowl into a mud bath. For Lonnie, handling this house-sized truck has turned from a challenge into a near-impossible task. The roads get quite muddy, and uh, it's easy to turn a truck around in the mud like that. 
In these conditions, every turn is a potential danger. One slide could send them crashing into the wall. It's a nightmare situation. And suddenly, nightmare becomes reality. Lonnie's truck took a dangerous slide off the mine track. After this close call, all mining operations are halted. Thankfully, the storm passes and nobody is hurt. The midday sun soon soaks up the downpour. But sliding off road, the crucial haul truck has punctured a tire and it's blocking the ramp to the crusher. Changing the tire will cost the crew even more time. It's a problem Billy could have done without. All right, I really need this today. All right, thanks a lot, bud. The team are now well behind schedule. They've still got over 160,000 tons to shift. Eric and his loader have even more work to do. But now it's not rain that's causing him problems, it's the heat. Sand kicked up by the deluge now fills the air. And winds whip up the dust clouds inside the mine. It's a perfect storm for mechanical problems. The heat, uh, the dust, the weather, it's all a major factor. To make up for lost time, Eric is pushing the loader to the limit. But even the mighty machine isn't immune to the conditions. Suddenly, it grinds to a halt. Oh, sh I think I have an hydraulic leak. I'm gonna have to call the mechanics. The loader depends on its 1,400 liters of hydraulic fluid to raise and lower the bucket. A leak renders it powerless, and the mine is still 100,000 tons short of the day's target. Over 100 million years ago, a vast prehistoric forest was buried beneath 100 meters of earth. The wood fossilized and turned into lignite or brown coal. Now Germany is closing its nuclear power stations, lignite production is the number one priority. But an obstruction in a drive chain has brought the world's largest mining machine to a shuddering stop. Foreman Thomas Bukatz has to find a way through the crisis. He calls his engineers together to brainstorm a solution. They can't use brute force without risking further damage to the jammed excavator chain. After a few minutes, Thomas and the engineers come up with an idea for a quick fix. They plan to force the blockage out of the excavator chain by pumping the section full of high-pressure grease. Thomas is anxious. The grease pump is usually used for lubrication and it has never had to work this hard. Eventually, the obstruction disintegrates in the flow of high pressure oil. At last, Thomas can give the order to fire up the mighty machine and get on digging. All three excavators are back online. The F-60 is stripping the earth away from the brown coal at breakneck speed. After a tricky start, they're more than halfway to the day's 150,000 cubic meter target. But after a couple of hours working, driver Ingo spots something. The conveyor belt sensors have detected an unwanted passenger. And whatever it is, is rolling through the heart of the machine at 30 kilometers per hour.
Genschwalder, Germany. At the Genschwalder mine, a mystery object has got onto the F-60's conveyor system. If it's a rock, it could smash the conveyors to pieces. Ingo orders an immediate shutdown for the conveyor belt. Operator Danny rushes down to check the damage. It's bad news. Oh, Ingo! The rogue stone has ripped a massive hole in the conveyor belt. Without the conveyors, the excavators will have to stop. No excavators means no mining. And the power station will starve. Hilfe, das ist scheiße hier. Aber so einen Schaden hatten wir hier noch nie gehabt. But Ingo knows the F-60 has nearly four kilometers of rubber belt available. If he can reroute dirt away from the damaged belt to two auxiliaries, they just might be able to keep it moving till the end of the shift. To make his idea work, they have to fire up the damaged conveyors again. Only once they're moving can Danny raise the auxiliary belt up three meters to take the load. It's not standard operating procedure, but Ingo knows there's no alternative. In an hour, Thomas meets the mine manager to deliver the day's results. Danny pulls off the rerouting maneuver, and the dug dirt is whisked away on the auxiliary conveyor. The F-60 is back in the game. Just an hour after getting going, the F-60 has to shut down for the crew to hand over to the next shift. Foreman Thomas now has to face the mine manager to go over the day's results. The guys behind the desks don't want to know about mechanical problems. They just need to see big numbers. With an astonishing 160,000 cubic meters of earth moved, enough to fill London's Royal Albert Hall twice over, the F-60 has exceeded the daily target by a massive 10,000 cubic meters. Oh, but it's not only Thomas passes on the good news to his crew. This is a good result. If you have the performance, it's always good, and if you have it, it's always better. If she can keep on digging at this rate, this veteran of the Cold War will make sure Germany's got the juice for all the heat the nation needs. One of the Viking amphibious transports has almost crashed into the side of the landing craft. A few more inches and the Viking could have damaged itself and the vessel carrying the entire unit. 2 a.m. The landing craft reaches the far shore and the Vikings get ready for a night deployment to their battleground. The darkness conceals the biggest, steepest dune complex on the British Isles. It's perfect practice for the extreme terrains of the Middle Eastern battlefields that these men and machines are headed for. All three wagons that have got the day-night camera, you'll go full black, you'll be on your camera and on your uh, Lucy goggles. And no time will we see white light unless or you're in serious distress where you're going to roll the vehicle or someone's got injured. The complex river crossing has put the operation hours behind schedule. But now the Viking crews have to fight their fatigue to show they can handle their vehicles on the kind of terrain they'll encounter in the field. But just minutes into the night assault, one of the Vikings stops dead in its tracks. The hard day's driving has taken its toll on the brake hoses, causing them to split and lose fluid. Guys can't brake, um, they can't go, go across the area, they can't, you know, drive. Can't use it at all. The entire unit is brought to a standstill while the Royal Marines crack mechanics battle to fix the problem. It's past 4 a.m. by the time the damaged Viking is back up and running, 
and the summer sun is starting to peak over the horizon. We're about to be going into cross country because we've got some nice the terrain and ground over here is perfectly suited to uh, really show the lads exactly what the Viking can do. The rookie Viking crews have come through a tough night and they've got tough ground ahead of them, but they've finally got a chance to strut their stuff. The final challenge is a climb up a dune face with an incredible 50% gradient. The steep slopes and sliding sands are no match for Vikings' raw power. Under the hood of this beast, there's enough grunt to pull it up a vertical slope. Zero, Roger, do you have uh, an, an ETA at uh, my location yet? Yeah, over. Yeah, tell him, tell him 15 minutes tops, we're on our way back now. Yeah, Roger. The training is tough on man and machine, but these Royal Marines have to be ready for battle. Fellas, listening. Right, it has been taxing. It's been numerous challenges, one after the other. These guys now know what it can and can't do, exactly what they need uh, to, to take this uh, vehicle to war. The Armoured Support Group's class of 2011 has learned its lessons. And now they're taking Viking to war. <laughs>